Yes. I like that you were podcasting even before, like, it seems like podcasts were a thing. Now, like, podcasts are everywhere. And then that's that's really cool. Um, and um, the fact that you liked, you realized that you liked the, like, the act of talking about film and just, like, yeah, that's, that, I thought that was really interesting. Um, what are you, are you working on specific things now? Well, at the moment, mostly it's still short of the week. Oh, yeah. And I forgot to mention, I screened for Southwest of West for two years, the last two years in the episodic pilot category. Oh, yeah. Um, at the moment, I would say I'm, I'm trying to transition into a new phase, combining the curating and still some creative urges. Mm -hmm. I think it's too early to talk about something specific. Okay. But I'm, I'm excited for what's to come, to be honest. I think mm -hmm. there will be a new, uh, I'm tempted to say revolution, but at least some kind of change now in the TV and film industry. Mm. As always, there's so much happening, but of course with, with COVID and with the changes in the theatrical business, but also what we're seeing now with Netflix having a hard time and streaming changing, streaming wars, I'm a big believer in niche content. Mm. And as we see with like Patreon and OnlyFans and Substack on, for writing and for podcasting or whatever, I believe there are chances for filmmakers, especially independent filmmakers, to even more so create a brand and connect with, with their audience if mm. they have a very specific voice. Mm. And that's what I'm excited to see and maybe play a part in. Mm. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to kind of dive into. The one thing I was curious about, like you said, your interest in American independent films. So what is it about the American independent film industry or American independent films that interested you so much? I'll try to keep it short, but I think <laughs> in the beginning, of course, it was when I'm saying American independent films, it was the 90s and the odds. Like the heyday of American independent film when Sundance got big and before Hollywood made independent film just a, another genre. Mm. And part of it, of course, was this um, vibe you got from it, something that made you cool mm. when you knew it or part of a club. Yeah. Like, especially in Austria, you, you didn't have access to all to all the films but I remember mm. watching coffin cigarettes by Jim Charmish yeah. the cinema and if I met someone else who watched the film I immediately felt connected and knew there would be something we'd get along mm. because it's so hard to seek out and then you know all the directors and all these obscure titles or I know having happiness on tv late at night recording it and Having the feeling of achievement for watching it. And nowadays it's almost too easy sometimes. Mm. But there just still is some things like Columbus by Coconada or Comet, one of the earlier Sam S model of films, mm. where I had to really go out of my way to order a DVD as a, like a, a French import, which had English audio mm. just to watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I was I actually had a student in my class that we were I was showing them coffee and cigarettes and they mm -hmm. they was like, I don't get it. They're like, why would anyone want to sit here and watch this? I'm like, oh, you don't get like I was like, oh, you you haven't seen this, but it's almost like it almost skips them even the interest to see it. Like you mm -hmm. mentioned it, and I'm immediately going right to the Tom Waits scene with um you know, with the, when he's talking about delivering a baby on the parkway and I'm just like, oh my God, that's like such an iconic, weird film, like weird little film, but you're right. It's like already, I feel like yeah, we could just hang out and talk about that film. Like that's the shared, like you were talking in your email, like that shared experience of like having seen that movie where like, even if you haven't seen it, that's, you don't get, there's that relationship's not even there. It's almost doesn't even want to be made in some ways. Yo, 
you said those you said coffee and cigarettes and it went i i watched that actually in an independent film class <laughs> and we like dissected that movie and as soon as you said that movie i went and i just like saw the the shots the way that he sh- shot everything and everybody that was in it and how i thought watching it like what it did to the actors like showing how cool the actor like to me like the mm-hmm. actors that were in it were so cool and like you said like the it was a shared experience of just like being in that it was like a little cult when you were into like independent films like oh did you see this like wild thing like you know i think spike lee was in it too before he got really mainstream Mm -hmm. like we had to watch a couple of his films as well and it's funny that you say dan that your students now are like i don't get it yet they'll go on tiktok and watch like a one minute like Mm -hmm. you know thing about nothing where I'm like, I don't get it. And they're like, this is so funny. I'm like, this is content to you? Like this, this is nothing. Like I'm watching a guy play with ping pong balls, trying to get it into like a little cup. But yet you're saying that coffee and cigarettes, you don't get it? Like blows my mind that that came out of that kid's mouth. But I guess but it's, also, we're in different times. But also the idea of those two things, right? Coffee and cigarettes. Like, th- yeah, that, that's true. That too. Like, cause I remember, like, it makes me think about, and I guess this goes deeper into what you were saying, you know, what um, the other questions I have for you as well, uh, Georg, that about nostalgia, how like, it's not even just the movie. It's like that cultural experience of being able to go to a place and literally order, order, order coffee in a diner and then open a pack of cigarettes, which is what I did for many years until I quit smoking and smoke cigarettes and drink coffee for hours into the night. Like that's something that isn't really a thing anymore here because you can't smoke anywhere inside and in, in, in the United States and drink coffee till all hours of night. So even that pairing doesn't make sense to some people. So they can't have that nostalgic like shared kind of experience with with someone. That's true, even though I never smoked, but just the idea of going to a diner as an, an Austrian, I, I'm so Americanized. <laughs> I've always been through films and TV and mm. like my, my friends in America sometimes called me an honorary American. Mm. <laughs> just because it's... <sighs> This inherently nostalgic feeling, I think, is a big part of it. How you connect to certain experiences you never had, but still feel connected to. Mm. And Coffee and Cigarettes was one of the films that just came to my mind because I had the poster in my room and it was a very important experience for me seeing it in cinema when I was about, I think, 14 or something. It was when IndieWire came up, Mm. still in web. 1.0 1.0 mm-hmm. but coffee and cigarettes also has an inherent nostalgic feeling being black and white how it was produced because it started with three short films that um, i think the first one with roberto benini and stephen wright was from 1986 and the third one you were referring to with tom waits and iggy pop from 993 mm. those were three shorts and then uh, he made a feature with more shorts behind it. Wow. And it's in its entirety, like taking out of time. Mm. It just sit there, like you said, to see those people sitting in the diner or having coffee, talk about stuff. And it doesn't even matter what decade it is. Mm. No. You're right there. Mm. Dude, that was a phenomenal film. I also see that you have in the in the not to stray off of that conversation, but in the left hand <laughs> corner you have uh, Midnight in Paris, which is one of mine and my wife's favorite uh, films to watch together, because uh, the idea of like you'd never think you belong in the time that you're in, mm-hmm. and you're always looking back. And even when he went back, and he believed that was like the golden age for him, the woman that he was in love with wanted to go even further back because she believed she wasn't in a good time. So it's like, we always are never, we're always like feeling for the past because we feel like the present isn't as, you know, that great, but yet people in the future are going to look at ours and be like, no, they had it. They had it great. They, they had it, 
you know, amazing. They had to be, you know, like, you know, when kids are in the future and they're like, they didn't have cell phones to bother them. And they grew up with bikes and, and, you know, all the stuff that we grew up with as kids. So it's funny that that movie is on your corner, on your wall. Cause I remember watching that saying like, there is a, there is a thing of saying like, is it bad to look too far, far back and not be in the present? Mm. But then at the same time, being like thinking about the past makes you feel good now. Mm -hmm. So like, it's a weird thing, Mm. nostalgia, because you don't want to get too, you know, like I always try to say like, oh, I got to live in the present. I got to live in the present. But there's just so many things. I love when I'm reminded about things in the past that make me enjoy now. Mm. So it's like this weird feeling like, so are we really enjoying the present? Or is it the help of the past helping us enjoy the present? That's a good point, yeah. But exactly, that movie is one of the most perfect examples when you talk about nostalgia. And also how he romanticizes nostalgia or the ex- entire experience being in Paris, being in Paris in the rain, falling in love. Mm. 